please. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Marco and Gemma, for uh, inviting me here to the sunny California <laughs> from the freezing Boston. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I need to say that um, this uh, work in general is funded by the Marie Curie uh, project, which you can see right here. And then uh, we can uh, get going. So um, the general story that I wanna tell you today um, is mostly focused about the question of how individuals and the communities that they are part of interact. So one of the questions that I'm currently mostly puzzled about is how individuals that interact with each other, that interact, um, that are part of um, different social groups, sometimes even overlapping groups, that are emerging their institutional commitments and in much larger collectives and communities, how are all these interactions between all these different societal elements affect the creation of scientific knowledge? So my uh, case study here is working on how mathematical knowledge is uh, created. And to do that, I'm trying to explore how the social, cultural, geographical to some extent, and personal aspects of mathematicians affect the development of their theories and, the re and their choice of research trajectories. Now, the specific case study that I'm using here is um, intuitionism. Um, which is a philosophical mathematical uh, school of thought that was developed in the early 20th century by the Dutch mathematician Lloyd and Egbertus Jan Brouwer. Um, how do I? Oh, good. So um, just a very brief and very incomplete sketch of the biography of Brouwer, since he is the individual we're talking about here. Um, so Brouwer was born in 1881 in uh, the small town of Overshe in the Netherlands. And by 1907, he had completed his PhD dissertation um, titled On the Foundations of Mathematics. Uh, and under, it was under the supervision of Diedrich Korteberg, who was a professor of mathematics in, at the University of Amsterdam. And it's important to know that Brouwer was always some sort of um, an amalgam to some people because um, his like professional trajectory combines philosophy and mathematics from the get-go to basically the end. Um, and Brouwer chose um, to pursue the mathematical um, um, direction instead of the philosophical one um, as a very practical advice from his supervisor saying that if you want to get a position in a university, you should go and pursue mathematics and not pursue philosophy. Long-standing advice, apparently. Um, and so in 1907, he uh, gets things done, finishes his dissertation, and the years between 1909 and 1913 are considered the most prolific years in Brouwer's um, work. Um, he founds modern topology, like following the advice of his supervisor, going to found, he's considered one of the founding father of topology. Um, and, con con and while doing that, while working on questions on, in classical mathematics, he also pursues his intuitionistic direction. So he never sees to work on his intuitionistic questions, but he also understands what is taken out of him and, and does the work that he needs to do um, in modern um, topology. And in 1913, he gets um, the uh, marvelous position as a professor uh, in the University of Amsterdam, succeeding uh, Kortweg. And in 1914, he gets an invitation to join the Mathematician and Allen, the editorial board of the Mathematician and Allen. Um, the Mathematician and Allen, as I'm, I'm probably all of you know, is considered to be one of the most important and prestigious um, journals um, in mathematics at a time. And to accept and to get an invitation to join the Mathematician and Allen board is basically a confirmation um, that you're part of the community. You now belong to a community of very specialized mathematicians, um, and you're part of the mathematical community um, in Europe at the time. Uh, the period between 1920 and the 1930 is considered the foundational debate, which I'll say something about um, in just a second. Um, between 1922 and 1926, Brouwer participates, um, forms and participates um, in a social movement that is called um, the Signific um, movement. And the Significs was a movement that was established in the Netherlands by his mentor, Gerrit Menory, and by Brouwer and a few other uh, fellows. And it aimed to explore the connection between mathematics, society, and language. Um, the circle dissolves around 1926. Uh, and in 1928, Brouwer gets fired from the mathematician and Allen 14 years after serving as a very um, committed editor. 
And um, this process uh, eventually occurred um, based on um, a beef, a personal turned professional, or maybe professional turned personal uh, beef he had with David Hilbert, which eventually resulted um, in his um, expelment from uh, the um, Mathematician and Allen Editorial Board. Um, and in 1930, the debate starts to fade, the foundational debate starts to fade, and the period between 1933 and 1942 is considered somewhat less prolific or even a pause in Brower's intuitionistic work, and it's caused by a combination of elements, um, two fires that happened in his apartment, um, a briefcase that was stolen that includes his most important notebook on a tram in Brussels, um, the break, of course, of World War II, and the personal um, um, conflict with Hilbert that had a lot of influence on Brower's general um, direction and, and, and general um, vibe um, in mathematics. However, in 1946, Brower starts to resume his mathematical work in a lecture he gives, uh, in a series of lectures he gives in Cambridge University. And in 1948, he emerges once again uh, with a new research program, um, as Mark Van Atten called it, a new research di direction um, uh, that um, kind of like resumes his foundational and intuitionistic uh, program with the notion of the creating subject, which we will talk uh, a little bit uh, um, about um, in a few more slides. In 1955, he publishes his last new uh, work, and a decade later, um, he passed uh, away. So um, before delving into Brouwer and his very important um, connections, um, let's say something about the general atmosphere in, in, in Europe at the time. And basically, um, around the turn of the of the twentieth uh, century, um, after the publication of of Cantor's uh, set theory, evolved a strong resistance um, to to Cantor's uh, work due to several um, technical, mostly uh, uh, problems. Um, some of them were more acute, some of them were less acute. To some of them, Cantor was aware of, and to some of them, Cantor was less aware of. And some of some of those uh, problem troubled Brouwer a lot. And basically his dissertation written in 1907 was actually written as some sort of a response uh, to uh, Cantor's uh, uh, set of theories. So he echoed this resistance in the dissertation and tried to um, provide a new foundations, uh, a new foundational approach to mathematics. Now, the figure that you see right here, the hist this histogram is taken from Dennis uh, Hesseling's book, Gnomes and the Fog. And it represents all the public re reactions to intuitionism between 1907 and 1933. So we see here that around um, when the publication of Brouwer's uh, dissertation occurred, you see a, little, a very small bump uh, in 1907, which is to be considered. Um, and around 1913, 1915, we see some spike. Uh, this spike is mostly attributed to the translation to English of Brouwer's paper on formalism and intuitionism. Uh, which gained, started to gain a lot of uh, echoes within the community, since now um, the US and English speaking audience cannot also read and engage in the discussion. Uh, but the most important um, um, spike of this um, sort of, 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 the, of a public re reaction was actually given by Hermann Weil. Uh, in 1921, uh, Weil, who was Hilbert's most prominent student, and perhaps a lot of the conflict is rooted over there, um, publishes the paper on the new foundational crisis in mathematics. Um, and Weil, um, in, in the paper, Weil gives a very, very um, clear and coherent expose of Brouwer's um, ideas. One of the things that Brouwer was known of is to write very, uh, very, very difficultly um, and, and very incoherently, in, in a very incoherent kind of way, his mathematical um, views. So even if you wanted to understand intuitionism, and even if you were a mathematician that's trying to like take this leap towards intuitionism, it became very, very difficult because of Brouwer's own writing style was very, very hard to understand. So Hermann Weil not only proposed his own intuitionistic view and not only called Brouwer as the revolution itself, he also gave a very clear exposition to Brouwer's own views, um, thereby uh, initiating basically um, the discussion about the foundations of mathematics. So we see that there, there has been quite a lot of um, reactions between 1920 and 1930. And the other major spike around 1931 uh, is attributed to Arendt Hating. Um, now, Arendt Hating was Brouwer's most prominent student. He was an intuitionist as well. And, but what Arendt Hating did in 1931 is publish a series of paper that did a formalization of intuitionism. 
So Hayden, in some sense, took intuitionism one step closer to classical mathematics. And this is something that Brouwer would have never have had. Yeah. Sorry, the uh, number reduction before 10 is Russell. What? What do you mean? The, the, you say in 1905 or something like that. Mm -hmm. There. Here. Ah, the small one, you mean? Yes. No, this, well. no. so this is 1907, and this is the publication of Brouwer's dissertation. Uh, okay. So this is kind of like spiked um, one okay. or two reactions so within, the, okay. Okay. within the... Okay, okay. the Yeah, this is only about intuition. So this is okay. called the reactions okay. only, only to, intuition, to intuitionism uh, within the, 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 the framework of 1907 and 1933. Um, but it doesn't end in 1933. So, no, right. Yeah, um, right. So, Hating's work, the, form, the formalistic system that Hating developed basically uh, gave way to uh, other um, people to engage with um, intuitionism, also from a classical or a more systematic uh, point of view. So, um, mm -hmm. in the 1940s and the 1950s, there were developments to this formalist systems made by John Crazel, uh, George Crazel, and, and John Myhill, and Anne Proelstra, and, and their students. Um, and in the 1970s, there was another sort, sort of um, public reaction to intuitionism, this time coming from the philosophical community and very much initiated by the work of Michael Dammit, uh, which, again, took a completely different way of um, Ralph Brower's own intuitionistic ideas. So Michael Dammit focused mostly on language um, and on, on the logical foundations of uh, meaning and truth and questions of, of how language, meaning and truth are connected. Um, again, something that really, really distanced from the work of Brow, but does have an intuitionistic um, foundation to it. And Dammit's work initiated a whole lot of responses um, in the 80s and 90s between uh, Prav, like Pravitz and, and, and Tate and, and, and other that, uh, philosophers that have uh, originally t talked about um, intuitionism. But again, this is from a philosophical uh, point of view. So as you see, we have a story not only about different individuals, but also about different, at least two different kind of communities. We have the mathematical community and we have the philosophical community and some of their interactions, cons and some of them, some of the individuals participating in each of these communities um, constantly interact with each other. So this is something to, to bear in mind. Um, so what's what's Brouwer's intuitionism um, all about? Now, according to Brouwer, um, to Brouwer's uh, intuitionistic ideas, um, mathematics is first and foremost creations uh, creation of the mind, in the sense that mathematical existence equals mental construction. So according to Brouwer, we have this sense of tuity, which is basically the idea of unity plus unity. And we have the inner ability to add unity to it. So we can construct, for example, the set of the uh, natural numbers. So we start with 2t and we add one, we have 3t and 4 and 5 and 6 and so on. And we can only reach potential infinity by this construction, constructive kind of way. So um, mathematical objects are only uh, can only be uh, finitely graspable. OK, so this constructive kind of way can only talk about finite objects and, and finite entities. And we can talk only about infinity in potential since we cannot do anything actual with it. So we cannot like do any arithmetic on, on infinity or, or stuff like that. Again, very um, re a resistance to contours set uh, theory. And, and now we can see why. Um, and according to Brouwer, mathematics is a languageless activity. Um, Brouwer believed that language actually bears all the inaccuracy that there is. So he kind of acknowledged the fact that people have to use language in order to convey ideas and to try to explain their mathematical notions to one another. Um, but as soon as language is part of the game, according to Brouwer, um, language is actually reduces mathematical exactness. Um, and Brau claimed that there are no in principle unknowable uh, truth. We will see that in his concept of, of the creating subject um, towards the end of the lecture. Um, so this basically means that intuitionism, intuition, um, is the only ground for certain knowledge. So the self is the source of knowledge, and any, any epistemic assertion or assertion that exists must exist through the self. Okay, so this, this is all we have. We have our minds and all that happens inside. So... Um, following this um, very um, short exposition of intuitionism, it's very understandable why many scholars connect Brouwer intuitionism to a solipsistic approach. Solipsism is uh, the idea that knowledge of anything outside one's mind is unsure, and a lot of scholars connect uh, Brouwer's intuitionism with solipsism. So what I'd like to do today um, in this talk is... Uh, yeah. 
Um, so I'll say more about it uh, when I reach the subject of the creating subject. Um, the general idea is that basically um, you as an entity, as an idealized entity, and we will talk about that in a second, you can know anything that there is to know. You don't, you don't dis go outside and discover truth. The truths are there in your mind. And all you have to do is to perform some sort of a construction to reach them in some sort of way. But all that there is to know, you can know. Oh, that's a very good question. And this has a lot to do with uh, Brower's views about objectivity and truth. And Brower himself contradicts himself sometimes. So on one one time, you can find him saying that um, every mind um, has its own like subjective way of, of thinking. And on the other hand, he says, no, but mathematics can actually be influenced by external and outside um, elements. So this is a, it's a very good question. We'll talk a little bit about it um, as we go along. Yeah, it's not that, that there is a more temporary truth because mind is very powerful, but because all what can be told that is true mm -hmm. is in the mind. Exactly. Exactly. This is where this is the get go. Okay, the get go is the mind, and everything is in it. All that we need to know, all that we want to know, all that there there is to know, is in the mind. Okay. So. Um, what I'm going to do today um, is to try to challenge this connection between intuitionism and, and solipsism. And the way that I want to try to do it is to uh, focus on the social and the communal aspects of Brower's intuitionism. So first of all, I want to show that the, these social and communal, communal aspects exist, okay? Um, I want to show that Brouwer was concerned about the role of mathematics in society, and he was concerned about how people participating and um, practicing uh, mathematics affect the use and the content of mathematics itself. The second thing that I like to do um, is to explore what can we learn from these social aspects. So what can we learn about what insights they, these social aspects can provide us about the narrative of the development of intuitionism? And the second question is, what can these social aspects teach us about the subject matter, the content itself of Brouwer's mathematics? Eventually, this will support the disconnection between Brower's intuitionism and solipsism, but this, this is not the main goal of the talk. The main goal of my work today is to reveal a new layer in Brower's intuitionism, which is the social layer. So um, the best place and, and maybe the most um, obvious place to, to start with fleshing out those social aspects um, is the significant social movement, which I briefly mentioned, and now we'll um, go more deeply into it. So first of all, um, what is the significance? The significance, the term itself, significance, uh, was coined by L Victoria Lady Welby in 1896. Um, now, Victoria Lady Welby was a British philosopher, self-educated uh, philosopher, and she wrote a paper which you can not see, but you, you can, you, you trust me. And the paper, um, his title, uh, Sense, Meaning and Interpretation, uh, and in this paper, she suggested that um, a theory, a new theory called the significance, um, that um, a significance is, is a theory that focuses on signs um, as a means to improve communication and eventually solve social problems. Now, in 1908, uh, Frederick van Eden um, brought, he was the first one to bring um, significance into the Netherlands. So he wrote a paper um, that um, was the first paper in the Netherlands that addresses the concept and the theory of the significance, but without mentioning anything about Lady Welby's uh, name or her uh, previous paper. In 1912, Jacob Israel de Haan um, was uh, the first to actually acknowledge uh, Lady Welby's work, and he published a paper titled New Philosophy of Legal Language, and in that paper he actually establishes the significance, giving credit to uh, Lady uh, Welby, and from this point onwards, like the works of Van Eden and De Haan basically mark the beginning of the discussion about the significance um, in the Netherlands. The, the, the paper is in English? The New Philosophy of Legal Language, yes. It's, it's not in English, it was written in Dutch, but there's a, trans, a, a yes. translation um, to, to English. I'm sorry. Yeah. Where was this published? What? Um, so it, it was published in, in, in um, uh, a volume of, of, of works um, that um, I'm not entirely sure who was the editor of this volume, um, but it was a volume about um, philosophical um, approaches or, or historical approaches um, to uh, science, meaning, and language. 
Okay, um, um, I, I can try to look up the exact the exact reference. Um, but it was it wasn't a book that Lady Welby published on her own. It was in a start in a, in a, in a volume of a collection. Escape my, sorry for that. Um, okay, so um, significance was brought to the Netherlands uh, by Van Van Eden and De Han, and in 1917, um, championed by Gerrit uh, Mannery, who was Brouwer's um, mentor, and by Brouwer himself, including Van Eden and De Han, and um, a few other members, um, established the uh, International Academy for Practical Philosophy and Sociology, which is a long name um, of uh, um, and, and, and some sort of a group, or let's in today's terms, it would be an academic group or a, an academic department trying to think about questions that connect um, sociology, philosophy, uh, science, uh, and uh, and discussions about science, meaning, and language to on top of uh, of all that. Um, and the academy lasted for uh, five uh, years. Um, in 1922, um, as all good things, um, they ran out of, out of funding. Um, and then some of the members, with some exchange of the number of the members, formed uh, the Signific Circle. Now, the Signific Circle was a natural successor of the um, International Academy. And the most important um, things for historians um, from that came out of the Signific Circles are the Signific Dialogues. So unlike the Academy, the Circle has actually had dialogues, documented dialogues in Dutch, and some of them were even translated to English. Um, and the Signific Dialogues were published in Sintiz, um, some of them in, uh, in 1937, and some of them uh, so light in the 19 the 1975 book of Arendt hating uh, so you can uh, try to read them uh, uh, if you want uh, and the Signific circle which uh, dealt with questions that connect to mathematics language and society um, met regularly in those four years between 1922 and 1926 and eventually it dissolved with um, some of the members actually uh, living and the de deteriorating health of one of the other members of the Han and and Van Eden left uh, and basically um, it dissolved um, as as natural things do. Um, but the interesting question here is why would Brouwer, who originally uh, was very um, against the idea that mathematics and language are anywhere connected, and who thought and who thinks that mathematics is a creation of the mind in the sense that we actually don't need other people or other groups um, to, to talk to in order to advance mathematical knowledge because we can know whatever there, there is to know. Why would Brouwer participate for almost a decade and be a very dedicated participant, be, being one of the head members of um, these two groups? Um, and this is, this is the, the intriguing question that led me to think that there must be something more here than merely um, 10 years of just participation in some circles. Um, so what kind of drove Brouwer to, to really engage in the Significs um, um, uh, circle? So um, the goal of the Significs uh, movement um, and the new academy as, as Brouwer saw it, uh, was to better understand how individuals' ideas can find their way into the commons and therefore magnify their social impact. Now, Bauer himself states in the prospectus of the Significs movement, and quoted here, I'll read it to you, um, the undersigned, meaning the members, um, hold the opinion that when the same task could be undertaken in common by a group of independent thinkers with subtle and pure human feelings, their thoughts formed in the mutual understanding of their circle would necessarily find a corresponding language, allowing them to enter into the mutual understanding of the multitude. It must be kept in mind that the thought in its, equality, in its inequality of embryonic deed has a far greater possibility of development when it is the common intimate conviction of a group of human beings than in is the case of its belonging to one individual only. So Brouwer's specific choice of words here, specifically as he highlights that scientist thoughts are formed in the mutual understanding of the groups, suggests that at the very least he noticed a difference between individualistic work and collective work, and he acknowledged the benefits of the latter. So according to Brouwer, when a group of individuals forms an idea, it enables them to enter the mutual understanding of the commons in a much more effective way than the individualistic thinking does. Now put differently, since thoughts are shaped to some extent by their thinker or thinkers, group thinking make thoughts shareable because they are the product of a collective mind. 
as a result, ideas can evolve and prosper much better when cultivated in a group mode than, um, than when they're cultivated in the mind of one individual. Now, this sort of statement basically supports the idea that a group or a community or a collective holds the key to creating and spreading knowledge, which is very atypical thing for a solipsis to say. Now, one of the most influential characters, which I, I've, I've mentioned um, in Brower's life was, was Garrett Menwe. Um, and he was, as I said, the leader of the Significant Movement. And he's, he's a very intriguing and, and special uh, character of, of its own. So he was a mathematician without any formal degree that eventually landed a professor position in, in the University of Amsterdam. It can be done. Sorry, can, uh, 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 question. Yeah. He said embryonic deed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't say browse. So English is not good enough to understand what the real deed means, mm -hmm. action, act. But I think that here it means something more. So what's the idea of embryonic deed? Um, so first of all, this is an English translation of a Dutch. Okay. Ah, okay. So we are all bounded by the problems of translation to begin with. Um, and I, I don't read Dutch, so I don't know exactly what the word he, here means, but from the context, that's from my knowledge about Brouwer's work, um, I think that he means thought. So he's still talking within the realm of the human mind, um, but now the thoughts become more shareable because these thoughts are shared and discussed within a group context. So we're now leaving the idea that thoughts are only within one's mind and we're somewhat detaching from the fact that language is problematic and reducing all the exactness of mathematical thoughts. Uh, and it seems here that Brouwer takes a step towards um, the idea that thoughts can be shareable and that when they are shareable, they actually have an ability to reach um, more and more people rather than thoughts that are kept within. In this quality of embryonic deed, mm -hmm. they seem to use the word the deed to explain what the thoughts is. Or so is it or the future of thought. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You or know, or to know, explain. But I don't read it, I don't read it as a definition. It's a it's a feature of thought. Mm -hmm. But he's saying thought, but only in this quality of embryonic deed. Yeah. It would be good to understand what yeah. it means by, by mm -hmm. the knowledge of Holland, of the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know I like their court okay. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we can. I I can look up the original uh, the yeah, Dutch meaning, which so. which would be interesting again to yeah. think. But but yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so. Yeah. Um, so um, going back, um, going forward uh, to to Manory, um, who uh, you see his picture over there, um, and this is obviously Brouwer. Uh, and now, um, Manory was also a Marxist and a political activist. And Manory believed in breaking paradigms and in giving uh, blows to the authority, which is a quotation of, of one of his uh, titles to his papers. Um, he also believed that language is very important and, and has a lot of, uh, and, and carries a, a significant element in understanding human behavior and mathematics, which is completely against um, Brouwer's own ideas. But um, yet again, they were very close friends and mentors. Now, um, here you see a dialogue, um, part of the Significs dialogue that occurred in, in 1930. Um, it was it actually occurred in 1922, but it was uh, quoted from the um, so the, the Sintiz paper from 1937. Um, and Brouwer uh, says here, um, and there it was part of their discussion about what's the connection between mathematics and um, um, society in general. And Brouwer says here that true mathematics never lacks significance because it is never without a social cause. Men come to think mathematically because only by applying this method of thinking was he able to prevail in the struggle for life, which became more and more complicated and difficult. Now then Manory challenges him and asks, okay, yet mathematics is cultivated to a large extent as, as lar pour lar, and then the formal structure does grow quite independent of social aims. Um, Brouwer is not confused and, and, con and, and, and answers uh, very confidently, I am not so sure of that. Mathematical thought, or rather mathematical sentiment, is a sort of network connecting the data which are necessary or valuable for our life. 
a formula and perhaps even a calculating rule, as long as it is manipulated, really has an asserting character in many more cases than would follow from Mannery's ideas. And I think that even the formula borrows its only importance from that asserting character. Now, this is a very interesting and, and rather undiscussed quote um, of Brouwer, implying that Brouwer did not think that mathematics is practiced independently of social circumstances. Now, according to him, um, the significance of a mathematical formula actually derives from its asserting character, which is constituted by the formulas being manipulated and operated by members of the community. Now, similar to Brouwer's remarks on group thinking, which we saw in the previous slide, this exchange of words with Mannery indicates that at the very least, Brouwer ascribed to people or the community a significant role in shaping mathematical knowledge. Now, to, to illustrate uh, the idea of, of that manipulation and the asserting character of a formula, Brouwer gives the illustration of uh, a, a bookkeeper of a bank. So um, he starts by describing why he thinks that um, this, this bookkeeper um, can be related and connected to the communal aspect of mathematics. Now, the banker sends an important telegram. This is living, asserting language. The code words in which it is written for, form what I call sequence of entities, which represent another sequence of perceptions and unattained aims. In other words, there are as many links between the ultimate aims and the nearest means. If now the content of the telegram is reproduced in the bookkeeping, it does not lose that character, but it becomes only more difficult to perceive the connection between means and aims. The sequence of entities is transformed. Now for the bookkeeper, this connection is then dissolved into a general feeling that he has con conscientiously performed his duty, a feeling that is positively akin to the sentiment that constitutes for the mathematicians the notion of truth. Now, the code words in, in the banker's telegram represent what Brouwer calls asserting language in the sense that these words carry connections to other aims and means of the bank. When these words are reproduced in different circumstances, tracing the connections becomes much more challenging since now the context of using these words has changed. Now, the analogy that Brouwer makes to mathematics is that mathematical expressions and formulas are part of our everyday language and individuals acquire them in certain different social circumstances. Now, the process of acquisition in the social context differs between different individuals, of course, thereby affecting the way those individuals use and manipulate these formulas. But once these individuals did acquire or did use these formulas or did some sort of a manipulation about on these formulas, they get a sense that resembles um, what the sense mathematicians get um, when they move one step closer to the truth. Now, the notion of truth is, is also um, something that Brouwer refers to in its social context. So he claims that, um, for me, truth is a general emotional phenomenon, which can be coupled or not with the formalistic study of mathematics. And therefore, I do not recognize as true, hence as mathematics, everything that can be written down in symbols according to certain rules. And conversely, I can conceive mathematical truth, which can never be fixed down in any system of formulas. Again, just as in the administration of the bank, on the one hand, it is quite possible to falsify the books through heeding all the rules of the art of bookkeeping. But on the other hand, it is impossible to enter into the books all the consideration of the banker and all the other factors that influence the financial power of the bank. Okay, so first of all, Brouwer makes clear that just as mathematical formulas cannot be reduced to linguistic symbols without losing at least some of their essence, so does mathematical truth. Now, the essence of mathematical expressions and formulas is rooted in the accompanying elements of the entity, okay, such as the social context in which it was used or the social context in which it was learned or the social environment in which it was created and so on. Now, the same is true for mathematical truth. So the phenomenon of truth is too general to be accurately articulated in linguistic symbols since, again, resorting to the illustration of the banker, it is quite impossible to account for all the considerations and all the other factors that influence the concept of mathematical truth. So what we've seen so far is uh, strong evidence uh, for a communal trend in Brouwer thought regarding the social context of mathematical element. 
a trend that completely opposes the solipsistic views we mentioned earlier. Now, from a historical perspective, there is a tension here between these two strands, and this tension is the focal issue that I wanted to raise our attention to. Now, let's try to shift the focus a little bit and try to examine the impact of these social views on the content of Brouwer's intuitionism, on the subject matter of his theories. Uh, and the best place to start is uh, in the idea of the creating subject, um, as promised. So the creating subject is uh, a notion that Brouwer introduced in 1948 after a very, very long pause uh, that he took from uh, publishing. Um, this sort of a break, um, again, was basically um, a combination of, of, of several social cultural um, elements, um, but also due to the conflict uh, between Brouwer um, and Hilbert, uh, known as the Brouwer-Hilbert controversy, the war of the fog and the mice. Those who have heard this lecture previously probably remember that. Um, and this conflict uh, eventually resulted in Brow dismissal from the uh, the Annalen in 1928. Uh, and what you can see here in this histogram is the uh, number of publications, um, just to, 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 to give a hint about how um, this firing and conflict with Hilbert affected Brower's work. Um, so we can see that from 1905 until around 1928, Brower published a remarkably and very envious amount of papers each year. Um, you see that the publications in red are the one that he published in Dian Allen. So there uh, is a significant portion of publications from within the general amount of our publication that occurred in, that were part of uh, uh, Dian Allen's um, uh, journal. And, and you see that in 1929 onwards, uh, not only that the amount of total publication is reduced to almost zero, um, he insisted on not publishing in Dian Allen, and he um, convinced his student, Aaron Hating, to do the same. Um, this is just, um, just, just, just an anecdote about um, how personal conflicts affect the trajectory of, of scientific journals. Uh, so, um, in... It's always a tricky problem. <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, in 1949, there is a, some sort of a spike. Again, it's attributed to the publication of, of, of the starting of the publication of the works that Brower made on the creating subject. Um, and it's basically the kind of like resurrection uh, of Brower um, to, to re-engage in intuitionistic and, and mathematical work after this very, very long pause. I mean, he chose the creating subject as the, the topic to do so, uh, which is a very interesting choice because um, it has been claimed that for Brower, um, the, the idea of the creating subject was a radically new approach, and it was the closest thing to a psychological interpretation of mathematics, which you can see why we find very, very, very good interest in. So what is, what's, what's the theory of the creating subject is about? So the creating subject is basically an idealized subject who can, by itself, uh, do whatever mathematics that can in principle be done and whose activities are structured as, as an omega uh, sequence. Okay, so omega sequence is a finite sequence of the ordinal omega. Remember, we cannot talk about um, actual infinity, but we can talk about potential infinity, and we can talk about finite sequences as part of that potential um, uh, infinity or just uh, in general. Um, and this uh, idealized subject is ideal in the sense that it does not have any time or space limitation, nor does it make any mistakes. So as, as um, the mathematician Antroelsto puts it, we may think of ourselves as we should like to be. Okay, so this is the, the idealized um, subject. Um, it also has the ability to look back on its earlier activity. So it has the ability to reflect uh, and to project an initial segment of, of that omega sequences, such for example, the natural numbers um, onto its earlier acts which basically means that it doesn't forget anything. And it can also do this again and again in the future. So it basically holds the accumulation of knowledge that exists, okay? So I don't understand what you mean by finished kinds of sequence of ordinal omega. The omega sequence is usually is not finite by definition because it's, a, it's any number of successors. Mm -hmm. so an element of the final sequence as a successor. So in which sense we can have something that is at the same time final and an omega sequence? So out of all... You, you take omega as an ordinal, 
if the, fine, the sequence is final, the order is irrelevant. So out of all um, Cantor's um, measurement of order, um, Broward accepted, the only one that Broward accepted are, are the omega uh, um, or ordinality. Um, and he talks about um, um, an, an adjustment uh, to, to this, this kind of like sequences. So he talks about the ordinal omega, but he talks about it as a finite sequence, which means that you can construct the sequence until you can reach a potential infinity. You can never reach the actual omega, you can never reach the actual infinity, but you can talk about it in terms of like projecting in once. In the moment you can continue, but you never finish to continue. Exactly, you never finish it, you just go on and on. Um, so the creating, sub the creating subject can generate choice sequences, um, which are um, some of the most important and complicated entities of a browse intuitionism. Now, it has been argued that it might be the uh, motivation behind Brouwer's um, introduction of the creating subject, which is, again, a natural successor of Brouwer's counterexamples, for those of you who know that, and it yields much, much stronger results than his previous work. So this some, in, in some sort of way, it was some sort of a continuation of Brouwer's previous work. He did mention the creating subject in works from 1927, not in this specific name, but in, in the, general, uh, the general sense. So the creating sub, to, so to say that it was introduced, it was formally introduced in 1948, but the ideas of it were actually existing in Brouwer's work from the um, um, late 20s and early uh, 30s. Um, so um, the, the, create, the, the general idea, the theory of the creating subject uh, have been um, a subject of investigation for many, many philosophers and mathematicians that followed uh, Brouwer's work. So several of them have actually tried to develop a theory, an actual theory of the form of the creating subject and an actual formalization of the creating subject. Um, and some of the attempts, the attempts started around the 60s. Um, the most um, renowned or primary uh, attempt was in 1967 by uh, George Kreisel, who uh, introduced the following axioms um, marked CS1 to CS3 here. Um, and we basically uh, start with um, the first line here um, with a basic notion of, um, um, of this, um, of A, uh, which basically denotes that the creating subject has a proof of A at time N, okay? Um, and the first axiom uh, says that at each stage, it is determined whether or not A has been proved. The second axiom says that the creating subject never forgets, right? Remember that he is not limited by any time or space constraints. And the third axiom, mostly its second conjecture, um, is known as the axiom of Christian charity, which means that there are no in principle unknowable truth, as we talked about. Now, in 1969, uh, mathematician Antro Elstra enters the scene and tried to strengthen the third axioms, which you see here as, as CS3+, plus, um, which now going to mean that the creating subject only proves what is true, and what is true will be proved eventually by the creating subject. Now, the third axiom, as you probably uh, see, is the most controversial one. And some scholars claim that it is even not acceptable from a constructive point of view, such as Lawrence Sondholm. And Godel's incomplete this theorem actually implies that under some circumstances, this principle of Christian charity is, actual, is actually false, okay? But we don't care about all of that because what's important to our story is what exactly does this creating subject refers to? Now, according to Duke Nikos, there's no idealized subject in Brouwer's notion of the creating subject. There's only us, human beings, and Brouwer actually refers to I or we. So Nyko says that according to Brouwer's view, mathematics is the creation of the human mind. And by using the expression creating subject, Brouwer only made explicit his idealistic position. It can be replaced by we or I. Interpreted in this way, an idealized mathematician is not needed at all for the reconstruction we interpreted the expression creating subject as we, and anybody else can interpret it at, as himself. Brouwer's definition is a description of construction as any intuitionistic definition, but the construction is not completely determined. The values of the sequence under consideration depend on the mathematical experience of the maker of the sequence, which is the creating subject. Okay, so according to Nikos, there is no idealized mathematician, but a real actual human being mathematician that does all these things. 
Now, philosopher uh, Karl Posey agrees basically with uh, such a position and even takes it one step further in terms of its communal dimension. So Posey claims, um, I'm assuming an intersubjective notion of the creating subject, distinct mathematicians addressing distinct issues. The third axiom and its extension shows that this differs in, in essentially from the so-called solipsistic versions. In practice, creating subject arguments assumes only that we can track the outputs of research on particular problems or the status of knowledge about particular objects. We might, in fact, be tracking the entire mathematical community. So Posey's approach not only distances the creating subject from a solipsistic point of view, but it brings the idea of intersubjectivity into the discussion and even the mathematical community. Now, if we think back about Brouwer's own remarks from the significance about the role of the community in asserting the character of mathematical formulas and shaping knowledge, such an interpretation, as Posey suggests here, actually provides another link connecting the social activities of Brouwer and the content of his intuitionism. So the knowledge the creating subject holds is the accumulation of knowledge of the entire community. So the community not only reflects the knowledge that exists, it also uses it, constitutes it, and creates it. This is miles away from where we started. However, um, as all good things, there's also a complication. So in a different paper, just written one year after the creating subject, um, titled Consciousness, Philosophy, and Mathematics from 1949, Brouwer is somewhat enigmatic in terms of, of his solipsistic views. So on the one hand, he argues that there can be no proof of the existence of other minds, as you can see in the quote over here. So there is no plurality of minds, so much the less is there a science of the plural mind. But on the other hand, he claims that by so-called exchange of thought with another being, the subject only touches the outer wall of an older maiden. This can hardly be called mutual understanding. Only through the sensation of the other's soul, sometimes a deeper approach is experienced. Again, somewhat enigmatic, but this quote um, is taking a step forward to uh, revealing the potential for other people's autonomous existence. And thus, it's some sort of a way out of solipsism as opposed to the first quote. So which one is it? That's um, the interesting uh, point. So there are several views regarding Brouwer's approach to solipsism in his work on, on the creating subject. Um, mathematician Ant Roelstra, for example, um, who was hating students, who was Brouwer's students, so second generation, uh, claims that a reconstruction, which would be based on the solipsistic explanation of the creative subject, seems to us to be undoubtedly anachronistic. Um, Hayding himself, um, who was Brouwer's student, claims that Brouwer had sometimes described mathematics as an activity of mathematical community as a whole. Now, um, Hayding himself held his own views about um, the role of intersubjectivity in our lives. Uh, in these two separate quotes, he says that the individual cannot be separated from the culture where he lives. And in another quote, he says, why am I convinced of the existence of Japan? Well, because I have been taught so at school and imagine that some men there perceive things as I myself perceive my environment. Here, intersubjectivity is going to play a big role. So we see here that later developments of intuitionism are clearly taking into account intersubjective aspects. And some scholars even believe that we can see evidence of that in Brouwer's own mathematical thinking. So reaching the concluding part of, uh, of this lecture, what I've tried to show you uh, so far is that first of all, there is a connection in Brouwer thought between mathematics and social elements. And the significance dialogues have proven to be a very resourceful resource for finding such uh, connections. Now, second, uh, this connection leads to a tension uh, between Brouwer's communal trend of thought, as we revealed it today, and his somewhat solipsistic uh, views. Now, as we saw, this tension resides in the foundations of Brouwer's mathematics from the get-go, and it paves its path into understanding the creating subject which on the one hand sounds very solipsistic, but it can actually be understood in a non-solipsistic sort of way. So if we look closely on Brouwer's mathematics, there isn't actually anything in the mathematics itself that requires solipsism. So perhaps the tension dissolves into some sort of a more of a vagueness.
like slightly lighter. Um, so zooming out to um, a more wider picture, embracing the such a position uh, that flushes out the intuitionistic point of view, um, the intuitionistic role of the society and, and, and how social aspects affect um, 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 intuitionistic mathematics, um, might carry some significant or broader implications on, on several um, interesting discussions. Um, the first is um, the discussion about the social history of mathematics. Um, so um, basically intuitionism um, was practically never approached from a perspective of social history. Um, I think practically, uh, practically or almost never because I'm excluding Herbert Merton's work, which you can see um, right here. Now, Herbert Merton's um, um, was a social historian and um, his book uh, published in 1990, so over 30 years ago, was basically the only book that tried to explore intuitionism from a socially oriented uh, pers historical uh, perspective. Now, um, Merton's cat basically tells the story of the foundations, the, the foundational debate um, through um, a historical perspective that focuses on the interpolitical relations between these, uh, what he calls two camps. So we have um, two different or opposing um, um, groups in Merton's casting. We have modernists and we have counter-modernists. Now, the question of, of modernity um, is basically based on, on the question of how language can create knowledge. So we have modernists believing that language can create knowledge or is basically the resource of creating knowledge. And we have those that believe in that knowledge is uh, deprived of any formal linguistic or not system, which goes with the counter modernist. Okay, this is basically and in, in very, I probably did not do any justice to Merton's, but this is very, on, very briefly the casting that Merton does. Now, Brower, as you can all figure out, is um, cast by Mertens to be part of the counter-modernistic um, uh, camp. But if the community does play a significant role in creating knowledge, as I've tried to persuade you today in, in Brower's own work, then Brower cannot escape the fact that language is necessary. And to some extent, he, he, he does not. He, he acknowledged the fact that language is necessary if we want to talk about how the community actually produces and creates knowledge. Now, if Brower does acknowledge the fact that language is necessary, then the affiliation of Brower's intuitionism with counter-modernism, again, casts in, into some sort of a doubt. So this is the first um, maybe um, problem or issue or, or discussion that can be raised or re-raised or rethought um, after thinking about Browers from um, a more social oriented point of view. Now, the second um, uh, interesting um, discussion, let's call it, um, is the realism, anti-realism perspective. So it's commonly accepted to affiliate Platonism with realism and then intuitionism with anti-realism. So this affiliation, besides the very the, a lot of inaccuracy and problems that it raises, both on the Platonism realism side and on the intuitionism anti realism uh, side, um, it actually carries a lot of significant consequences for cognitive and semantic questions. And it also blurs to some extent the boundaries between mathematics itself and mathematical objects. Now, on top of that, the affiliation of intuitionism with anti-realism is really not that ex explicit, right? Specifically, if we think about Brouwer, that on the one hand says that mathematics is a creation of the mind, but on the other hand, we see that his mathematics is affected by external elements, by social elements, by cultural elements, by group thinking, and so on. So this some sort of affiliation is also something that we should perhaps we think or reconsider uh, when we talk about um, this kind of like continuum of realism and anti-realism and where do we put intuitionism in this uh, some sort of way. Um, this obviously leads us to think about the concept of truth and proof uh, in intuitionism in general and which leads us to the third topic of truth and objectivity um, in, in science and in, in mathematics. So, um, the philosophical view of scientific realism is usually associates truth with objectivity. Now, some have argued that it is quite problematic since um, it, it is at odds with scientific practices where a plurality of scientific perspectives can be found. 
So mathematical pluralism, for example, which gains a lot of um, popularity in the past few decades is an example of how this shift um, sort of changed. So there is realism and there are pluralism and the question of how can they be combined or not um, in science is one question. And it also bears a lot to do with how can they or not be combined um, in mathematics. Now in science, there uh, is one way that was one of the many ways that was suggested to uh, get out of this problem is by um, the, pro the philosophical approach introduced by Michel Massimi um, in 2022, um, even previously before that, and it's called perspectival realism, which is basically a perspective aiming to reconcile realism and pluralism in science. And this perspective basically built on the idea that truth and objectivity are not interchangeable concepts, which is of particular interest to us intuitionists, since in intuitionism, truth and objectivity actually take on distinct meaning. So Brouwer himself says that mathematics is mind dependent on the one hand, but is also saying that mathematics is the same for every possible mind. So the questions about how truth and objectivity actually come to be and actually defined in intuitionism and how the ideas of proof, meaning and language are also interconnected within intuitionism and explained within intuitionism actually raise a few questions about how we should perceive truth and objectivity in mathematics and perhaps use it as a case study of how can we think about the this truth and objectivity as interchanging or not interchanging concepts in science itself. So from a broader perspective, my, uh, my research line uh, shows or tries to show at least uh, what good um, social philosophy or social prism of science and, and of mathematics in sp specifically can be for understanding mathematical practice. And in particular, it tries to highlight the different narratives and questions about the robustness of scientific knowledge and its role in society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, what was his last name, 2022? Michelle Amassini. Michelle Amassini, yeah. 2022, Perspectival Realism. Thank you. When you talk about Bauer and not having seen language, language is like city and Western phenomenon and this kind of thing, is it that there's like one true mathematics somewhere exists and I approximate it in my head and you approximate it in your head, or that everybody's running different parallel versions? You know, the question is about whether there exists mm -hmm. one mathematics. So it's both. The fact that Brouwer starts with the idea that we all, each of us, generates its own mathematical systems and mathematical understanding about truth, but they're all the same. This is the very, very problematic get-go point that I, I started with, and obviously it really contradicts with some of the other um, quotes and, and specifically the works in the significance, but in other, in his later works. So this is basically goes to the question of what are um, what do we mean by truth in in intuitionism? So um, I, I, I have I have a slide another slide that kind of like escaped um, from this presentation um, and. And I, I, I won't delve too much into the question of truth and proof before we can talk another 40 minutes about that, but in intuitionism um, when we think about what is actual what, what truth actually is it may refer to many different things. And it, first of all, it depends on who's, 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 who's individualistic point of view you're actually trying to trace here. So um, about, for example, um, the connection between truth and objectivity, um, there are, I'm, I took, I'm, I'm just given some sort of a like, very anecdotal quotes, which say basically nothing, but say something about these differences between how different intuitionists perceive the questions of mathematical truth. So we have Brouwer saying that math mathematical truth is mind dependent, and we have Hating saying that basically um, an objective notion of truth is unrealizable. And we have um, the, uh, Tennant saying that mathematics is objective and every truth is knowable. And Damet saying that we actually can't, um, uh, we may not be able to prove anything. Uh, and and Prowitz is saying that 
um, if you're constructive, you must identify truth with the capacity to prove something. Um, and and after understanding that we have so many different approaches to, to what is truth in, in intuitionism, um, um, we get to start to think about what's the connection between proof and, and, and truth. So if I come up with some sort of a system and I can prove it, what does it mean? To whom am I proving it to? I came up with it, okay? What what start, what rules of logic? What the, what are the standards that I obey obey by? Um, mm -hmm. And and these questions um, again had touch upon the connection between this individualistic thought, thought and and the community thought because once you start to talk about proofs, um, you inevitably talk about other people, okay? So and and this is where. I think the important, um, perhaps the philosophical questions we lies um, when we talk about Brower's own views about truth and 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 provability and about his social uh, and the community uh, views, because if we do take truth as referring to proof, either like either it, it, it either whether it refers to the truth itself, whether it refers to the construction of the proof or to the, some sort of a decision pr procedure of truth. These are, these are examples of later developments, but it basically relies upon the same idea. So um, it really bears upon the question of if you talk, if you think about proofs, then you immediately think about a community. And uh, Brower's very, very early quotes about mathematics is mind dependent and the fact that um, you can construct your own view or an, your own mathematical system, but it's basically the same in every individual's mind. You see that in the dialogues, he kind of contradicts that. Um, so um, I have no idea what actually Brower thought. And what I'm trying to do here is, I don't know, perhaps a bit provocatively, but to try to challenge the common thought that Brower's intuitionism is very uh, solipsistic, is very mind dependent, is very intrinsic, and is specifically uh, something that does not go outside or beyond the human mind. While it might in fact be that way, it might in fact be that Brower's intuitionism does not go anywhere outside the human mind, but the human mind is a tool that is constantly influenced by social elements. It's constantly influenced by other people. Brower himself was constantly influenced by the people that he interacted with, by the institutions he was affiliated with, by the groups that he was part of, like the Significs. Um, so these questions, which come from a more um, perhaps um, psychological or cognitive perspective, um, suggest that we need to perhaps rethink a little bit about what we, we thought about intuitionism so far, and what we thought about Brower's solipsistic ideas so far. So yeah, so it was it was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> While leaving it, Eric, you, you did a, you did a question. I would like I like to tell you a, a, an anecdote. Oh. Can you come back on the slide before? When this I one? I remember I was in a room, something like that. I don't remember where where Doug Travis was there, mm -hmm. and the discussion began about what make a theorem theorem, and Doug was in the audience, and he began to cry. That is true. Doug, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is true. But are you sure what you say? Yes, yes, that's true. So I tried many times to ask him, but what do you mean? You, you are an intuitionistic man. What do you mean? He never replied to me. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Thank you very much. I find it really interesting, and especially this the attempt to move about draw away from a solipsistic and psychologistic method mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, So I, and I like the fact that you look at the social context. So I had heard, I, had, I knew about the significance book a little bit, um, but I always wanted to know more about it to really to provide a lot of interesting information. Now a question about that and, mm -hmm. and even philosophy again. Uh, who were the members of the group and what was their philosophical background? Mm -hmm. Here is why I'm wondering more specifically. So you mentioned um, how one of them was a Gnostic. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But um, I know that um, Lady Welby was um, directly connected with uh, births and pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Was pregnancy significant for some parent people? I know that Hermann Weil was deeply into German idealist philosophy and Husserl. And so mm -hmm. Did that play a role? So what, the, the, for the members of that group, the significance group, 
Do you know about their philosophical checkpoints and so on? Um, okay, good, good question. Um, so first of all, um, to answer the first question, uh, no, pragmatism was not part of the agendas of uh, of the Salific Circle, and this is because um, the um, the circle initiated with Van Van Han with the Han and 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 Van Eden, uh, Manory uh, and Brower was the like the secretary and the treasurer or whatever, like they had like two the distinct roles, um, and the other members were kind of like coming and going. So the, the central four members were the four that I mentioned. Um, we also know that um, the circle included Henry Borel at, at, some, at some point. It included the physicist Leonard Ornstein. So we had people thinking about physics and metaphysics in terms of like um, how this um, connections between meaning and language and, and, and society are connected to the physical world. Uh, and we have and we had also HPJ Bloomers as one of the participants, but again for a very a short, relatively short uh, period of time. Now Herman Weil, um, who was not part at all of the significant circle nor the debate, um, indeed um, was very, very uh, Herman Weil is, a, is a, an entirely different um, individual super interesting persona, um, someone that um, uh, you can say a lot about um, how um, culture, society, pro specifically geographical moves, as, as we talked earlier a little bit about, influence his ideas. Now, Weil was, an, was um, very attracted to, to some of the, of the work by Husserl, and it was perhaps mostly because of his personal um, connection to that. So his wife, Elena, was a student of Husserl. Um, so they were kind of like hanging around the same circles. Um, and to some extent, this idealistic point of view was something that both Brouwer and Weil had shared, okay? Not exactly in the same ways as we see that they kind of devoured these ways, uh, but they did share an idealistic approach. So, and there might be some say that this might be the thing that kind of like draw Weil into Brouwer's intuitionism, drawing to declare that, that Brouwer was the revolution uh, and so on. Now, Weil himself, um, while uh, having this some sort of, um, let's call it an intuitionistic episode in, in between 1920, 1919, where he first met Brouwer and Engadin and then was very impressed by him and then the publication of the, uh, of the paper in 1921. Uh, but around 1925 or six, Weil already started to retract his ideas sort of back to a more formalistic or a more like classical uh, point of view. Uh, yeah, you, you can say, and, and then again in the thirties with the questions of constructive and axiomatic ways, um, and so Weil, I, I have another paper of, of about Weil trajectories and about like his very um, changed his changes of mind. And Weil was the person that was very very influenced also by Poincaré, um, and also by so the, the semi intuitionist was also playing a significant role in 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 Weil's uh, influences. And and this kind of like attempt of Weil to try to come up with what are the proper foundations of mathematics is actually a question that he never he never he never gained a, a, a satisfying answer for so in his latest paper in 1954 he says um about the question of whether should i choose axiomatics or constructive approaches that remain to be seen or something like that so it was one year before his death okay so the th the fact that that someone like Weil who um navigated between different um, philosophical and, and mathematical schools, um, found himself really um, in lots of words and unable to decide which one, which, which approach to foundations um, is, uh, is, is, is the one to take. Um, um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention about Weil um, is that Weil is also a good, a very, very interesting example of how transformations in terms of uh, political changes and geographical changes affect the research trajectory of individuals. So for example, just as an anecdote, uh, and I, I'm hoping that we have some time to, to say something, okay, we do, about this anecdote. So um, Hermann Weil, who uh, was first and foremost a mathematician and a physicist, okay, his contributions to this concept of subject matter uh, in, in physics and his major contributions to Riemann surfaces in mathematics were, were really something that cannot go unnoticed. Um, Hermann Weil considered himself a physicist um, for the period that he was in Göttingen, working with Hilbert, working with um, 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 other people that were part of his 
um, group uh, in, in Göttingen. And as he had to, uh, by 1933, he understood that he had to flee from Germany since his wife was Jewish. Um, and they ended up in the Institute for Advanced Studies in, in Princeton. They ended up in Princeton, which was kind of like um, the Institute of Advanced Study was a nearby institute. So they were kind of, everyone there was together thinking and talking about the most important uh, uh, things, which were not necessarily uh, bombs and atoms, but, but you know, the, the, the remaining uh, interesting things. And there's an interesting work by um, Skuli Sigurdsson, uh, that um, portrays how the um, the transition of Weil and uh, Max uh, Max Born and and another physicist which I can't recall right now I think it was Ernst Levenstein I I, I don't remember it but Weil and, and Born and he basically compares them and you see that um, when the transition for Born was a very prolific one. He got to know many other physicists and tried to work with them and, and developed new ideas. But for Weil, it was pretty much devastating. So Weil himself says that he lost his professional identity in a biography uh, written about Einstein later. He said that he lost his professional identity. And ever since the move um, in 1933, up until his death in 1955, so over two decades, um, Weil had actually never did any significant contribution to physics. Most of his work focused on mathematics and on abstractions of mathematics and a lot of the work of Amy Netter and van der Waarden and the people that were interacting with him um, um, in, in, in this, like von Neumann and, and others, interacting with him in, in the Princeton Institute. So the anecdote of Weil is just something, uh, another uh, anecdote of an individual who changed his research trajectory uh, by a change, by a, a geographical change that was basically forced upon him due to other cultural and political circumstances. But this is a good example of how cultural and social and geographical elements actually shape the creation of knowledge and the trajectory that certain individual mathematicians and physicists take and how their knowledge and, and how the theories that develop had a lot to do with those intrinsic connections to their own communities, whether they're home communities or current communities and, and so on. So yeah, again, another long answer for as the fact mm -hmm. right that it has um to be um the solution of the main or perhaps the assumptions of philosophical canonical philosophical conceptions that might be Again, what you're doing is gives you hope that this thing can be revisited. And you know, the approach from a, this very rich perspective, so that really makes me happy to <laughs> listen to this talk. So it, it dissolves some presuppositions that I think are very problematic in this, which can be transformed, and it provokes us to think about um to, to think. To learn better the history of our own self. Mm -hmm. um, the question that we dedicate our lives to, like the students in the cultural history of mathematics or history of aesthetics. So, and, and, and I think it's um, something you said to me in a way that illustrating the importance of this revision in our way of, of evaluating the problem, as you may say, for example. Um, in response to the point to interpret, um, the mind being in just the formulation, the mind being influenced by the social dimension. Mm -hmm. When we use being influenced, the presupposition is that we have one thing that is the mind and it's individual, and then another thing is society, mm -hmm. and our individual minds then are being influenced by something external when what I sense from what you're saying would to say that mind is individualistic. That the that mind as a 
dimension of human experience in the world because it's collective. And it, if it is, then even saying that our individual minds are influenced by society doesn't make any sense then. So this is just like, you know, the kind mm -hmm. of thoughts that are coming into my mind. So I'm deeply um, touched and very excited to talk to you more about your work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have I'll add two comments to, to what you said. So thank you very much for that. And, and it's very good that you, that you said it because I think it does demand clarification. Um, so first of all, about um, the connection between the mind and the society. Um, it's very, I need to choose my words very carefully here. Um, I really think that we cannot actually talk about an entity that is mind without thinking about society um, and, and the other way around as well. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortably dancing around those issues because um, I think I had a talk yesterday with Eric here um, about um, what came first. What came first, norms or groups? Um, do we define norms by something that is groupness, or do we define groups by norms? To some extent, yet not exactly in the same equivalence, this is some sort of, of the same thing. So my own agendas are that minds and societal elements affect and are affected constantly by each other. They are in some sort of a dyadic connection. But um, this is this is my point of view. Um, I'm terribly uh, um, um, careful not to project that point of view on Brower. So what I do is I try to approach Brower's uh, work from a, as blank as I can. Um, but to try to find in his own historical um, 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 excerpts uh, things that can support this some sort of a connection. And yet again, another um, um, caveat here is that, caveat, sorry, here is that um, I'm not saying that the mind is to some extent or to any extent socially constructed, okay? So this is very important. Um, there is a big difference between saying that our minds and our thoughts and our creation of knowledge is shaped by culture and social elements to saying that our minds or our ideas are socially constructed. There is an entire philosophical school about social constructions. Um, I'm totally not there um, for, for the time being. Um, the ideas that, um, that they uh, advocate, the, the ideas that basically stand at the roots of, of social constructivism are ideas that I think are very, very important, but they are not the ideas that you can imply on Brouwer's intuitionism. So for the purposes of this case study, it is not about social constructions at all. It is about how we can think about one specific mathematician as an individual that is situated in time, space, culture, and society as, as, as Stephen Shapin have said, um, and to think about how all these elements affect the um, actual content of his theory. This is the, the point one. Um, the broader perspective, whether such views can say something about um, um, wider debates like um, realism and anti-realism, I, I really hope so. And I think that I, I, I mentioned Massimi's work not, not, not by accident, um, because I think that um, a discussion that tried to challenge um, very obvious uh, notions or very obvious um, 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 interchangeability notions such as truth and objectivity or very conflicting ideas such as uh, realism and pluralism is very much in due, is very much, this is the time to talk about those ideas. And perhaps this is where social constructivism may contribute to these discussions. Um, but the basic idea is to actually um, think about um, Brouwer's intuitionism as a case study of how mathematics in general can think or, or how mathematicians uh, in general or, or how we uh, as 
people that study mathematics, no matter their, doesn't matter really the, the, the field or the discipline, how we can think about mathematical objects through many different prisms. One of them being the socially oriented prism that I tried to, uh, to uh, um, present here. Yeah, I, I hope that um, elaborates or uh, clarifies a bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a maybe small question. We'll see. Um, so at the beginning, and, and this a similar to Abba's question, I, you know, I have to try to thought very much. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned you know, Bauer's, you situated Bauer's position with respect to language. Mm -hmm. And then later, there's a slide where he's talking about um, the limitations of formula. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, so Brower is how do you think the critical relationship between language and formulas? Because formulas seem like something that can be formalized much more limited, whereas language, spoken language at least, has quite dynamic mm -hmm. shades of nuance that cannot be captured in formulas. And so does he lump those two together or does he make a distinction? So both are equally worst in, okay. in Brower's case. So they're equally bad. Um, and in, in Brower's, uh, in the basic ideas of Brower's intuitionism, uh, General, both the both the world wars were definitely affected Brower's uh, uh, work, both in terms of like very instrumental sort of uh, ways. He was enlisted um, to uh, First World War. He was um, injured and he got back. Um, and in the Second World War, uh, he actually uh, had to leave all his mathematical uh, occupation aside because he became the owner of a pharmacy um, given to him by his father-in-law, and he had to take care of family business. This is what he had to do. So um, gay, getting uh, back from the war into this family business, and, and this was something that has occupied his mind um, a lot. Um, another thing that um, was, uh, I escaped my mind that, that I wanted to say about it, um, but, um, um, oh, he was, <laughs> There were also contradicting uh, evidence about Brower's own um, political views during uh, the the two uh, during those turbulent times uh, in Europe. So we have some evidence saying that he was actually um, participating in some of the um, relatively close uh, not Nazi oriented uh, parties. But on the other hand, we had also some sort of uh, uh, documentation that he uh, was actually trying to save Jews uh, from uh, uh, Nazi uh, occupation. Um, again, this was this is not surprising because Brouwer is some sort of a two sided coin, at least in, in every in every aspect of, of his life. So um, and but this goes only to answer your questions in a personal, in very personal perspective, uh, in terms of like um, how did it, how did it uh, kind of like detached him from the community he was part of. So aside from having to leave the profession to 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 deal with the pharmacy that he had uh, going on, um, Brower was mostly operating. Um, Again, only within the very proximity of his um, affiliates, then some turned um, rivals. But he his work was uh, discussed in a very close circus, circles. So basically, um, Weil, Frankel, Hilbert to some extent before their big fallout, um, and Mannery, uh, and Cordweg, who was his uh, supervisor. This was the the, the community. That Brower had. Brower actually never um, engaged in other um, different uh, discussions. He did give public lectures in in many in many different places across Europe and, and in in the U.S. by the, around the 1940s, um, but um, he never was actually part of any of those community. So to that extent, the breakout of the wars did not disconnect him from any like fruitful mathematical community, not in the ways that you'd think about Hilbert or Weil or Einstein or and how they were like disconnected from their communities. So if that makes them clearer. So, yeah. uh, I have two questions. The first one is very short. It's, uh, it's concerning my ignorance. I am not a scholar of intuitionism, but I was a for Ten years in the same uh, uh, search team that Mark Manhattan, 
And mm -hmm. I never, never uh, heard speak about uh, senior ticks. Uh, Mark so, Never, never. Mark Vanatten? So, no, but it is in the question about Mark. Mark no, is no. Okay. My question is, uh, is this uh, uh, activity of Brouwer concerning mm -hmm. senior ticks Mm -hmm. Something that is discussed in the intuition the scholar, or is something that you bring out? Because it's the first, it seemed to me very important, mm -hmm. really very important, and the first time that I hear speaks about that. So I'm a little bit surprised. Um, good. It means that I'm doing my job because um, I think that the significance, which is something that I came uh, across only, I think, in my uh, last year of my PhD, I did my PhD on browser intuitionism, and I came across about, uh, about only only in my in my last year, and uh, in my last year, I also had a short conversation with Van Atten, and uh, who suggested me to read the work of. Um, I don't remember her name, but he has a student uh, that wrote a book about Garrett Mannery, a biography book, 600 pages mm -hmm. in Dutch, um, about Mannery, which obviously has a lot to say yes, about... Mark, a lot of time I repeated the influence of Mannery on, on, on Brower, okay. it is something that I discussed with you a lot of time. Masinitix, never. So I think that if we take upon ourselves the, the assumption that Mannery was a great influence of Brower, he obviously was, and we take upon ourselves um, the, the idea, we know that Brower participated in those two circles um, for almost a decade, it bears to say, okay, but so wh why? Why? If, he, if he, the significance is really insignificant, and if it was just an, an, episode, an episode or just, you know, some temporary, I don't know, like fluke of his mind, you know, like I, I sometimes participate in reading groups, and then I see after two or three meetings that I'm not really interested in that, so I leave. Why would I stay for 10 years and, and enjoy and, and go very, like, so, in a committed sort of way? This has, so I think that the fact that the significance is not talked uh, uh, about is because um, it's convenient to think about Brower's uh, intuitionism as, as some sort of a solipsistic way and to kind of like ignore this mm -hmm. um, um, very long, decade-long uh, period uh, of Brower's engagement with actually a movement that talked about the connection between mathematics, society, and language. So I okay, think that there is definitely something in it. And, and the fact that you say that uh, um, Mark has never mentioned significance is only, I don't know, it's uh, for- actually okay, mentioned, but I do not remember, but really it's absolutely not in my-, in my... Okay, so the, now the second question. Mm -hmm. There is a, 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 a slide, so now there is a problem there, but not, mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly which slide, in which you, um, uh, there is a quote by Manuri, I think, or mm -hmm. perhaps by, uh, well, I don't remember exactly. But it was a, concerning a, 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 a synetics, mm -hmm. where he say that the, the quote said essentially, where there is a community that begin to speak uh, uh, to speak together, so that the thought it was further mm -hmm. that so the thought become a common fact. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that the this uh, uh, quote uh, uh, refer not really to society, mm -hmm. but refer to small groups of people that can interact. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know if there are synthesis mentioned. And if I compare that with the fact that in the same years, Husserl was elaborating his idea about, uh, uh, um, what is the name? Uh, um, not sympathy, help me. Empathy. empathy. With the idea of empathy as part of a, a, a understanding. So it seemed to me that, uh, uh, of course, your uh, uh, your picture is very different than the usual picture of of, uh, of uh, Brower. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether you are not exaggerating a little bit with speak of society. Mm -hmm. You think that, that what you show more that a relation with society is a relation with a communication without, in a certain term, a community of empathy, or not? So this is the question. Okay, so um, let's go with the fact that I'm exaggerating. Okay, and let's say that there is nothing about society, but only about a small group. Okay, this in itself shows that Brower's intuitionism is not so successful. Absolutely, okay. no, no, but this I okay. totally agree. We I say your picture is in any case different okay. than the usual one. Okay. That I, I have no doubt. You are very convinced about that. Okay. Now the question is whether is social society mm -hmm. here or is a group of empathy in some sense. Okay, so I might revert the question back and ask you, what is a society? 
when we say that mathematics and uh, is socially influenced, we think that it is influenced by political factors, that mm -hmm. is influenced by the relation with, uh, I don't know, a lot of other factors that are usually we consider external to mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, feminism, machism, all these sort of things are part of what we call society. Mm -hmm. And so if you say that uh, uh, for Brouwer, mathematical is part of society, what I understand is that mm -hmm. there is no mathematic without all this environment. When I say that mathematics is part of a small community, I understand the completely different things. I think that I cannot make mathematics alone, but I need to discuss with Josh. John and Jose in want to make a mathematic. And John and Jose can be, can be completely independent of what's happening in the world. It's simply me and him and me. So that's a completely different picture. Uh, still, both pictures are anti solipsistic mm -hmm. So in this sense, I agree with you that the image you give a Brower and the, the larger discussion seem to me of manifestation, the fact that it's completely new, interesting, very good. Mm -hmm. But it is, the two pictures are different. Okay. Uh, so I have two comments on that. Um, first uh, is that in the terms of, of Brower solipsism and, and what I've presented here, um, I talk about social aspects and I talk about the community. Okay, so society may bear some sort of um, extra baggage with it that we might want to put aside for the second. Um, and I think that in terms of what Barrow talks about, the asserting language of mathematics, in terms of how the uh, community, and, and there he does say the community, because the bookkeeper at the bank or the uh, grocery store that uh, tried to calculate how much two boxes of milk, uh, how much I have to pay for them, um, are not part of Brower's community, are not part of his inner circle, okay? But these are people from the community that he talks about that can do and create those certain, give this asserting care character to mathematics. So in this in this aspect, I do think that Brouwer does talk about the community. Now, a second comment about the, the, the society and, and all the baggage that it bears. So you said that, that in your community, you talk to, to John and, and, and to, to uh, Jose, uh, but you also talk uh, uh, to Gemma, and you also talk to Deborah, and you also talk to me. Uh, and to yourself, you say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and we uh, just because we represent um, a different group, um, and and I want to elaborate more, but let's say that we do represent a different group. We bring into the discussion a different. We might bring to the discussion a different set of values, a sure. different set of standards, a different ways of thinking. Okay, without delving into the questions of the difference between. Males and females. I'm not going there. Yes, but, but, what, a, but this what, is the what, reason for which I was mentioning Husserl. When Husserl Paro speaks of a community of empathy, is in some sense opposing to society. You need to be a mathematician in order to understand mathematics. You need to be part of this small community. Otherwise, you understand nothing. So in some sense, it's certainly not solipsistic, mm -hmm. but in some sense, it's